Hello. 10 o'clock. It's about time to start. I have any mutes. So this is the, I'm not going to tie this particular color variation for you. I've got another one. But this is what the first one we're going to tie is a Clouser minnow. Um, it's uh, the, the version I'm going to tie for you is this one, which is the green over white Clouser. My picture is frozen there, John. Is there some reason for that? Uh, it's at your end. I can see your uh, see you moving and talking right now, Dave. Okay. And it, all right. Good. Okay. So, chartreuse over white is, today, is Dave. chartreuse over white is a pretty common uh, color combination. I've used this for coho fishing for fishing for browns. It it it's pretty good. Um, I uh, learned the proper way to tie this from Mr. Bob Clouser himself when he was visiting Calgary many years ago. So what the, the hook is in this case, it's a uh, Mustad streamer hook. This is a size four. Um, this is a 4XL, which is actually a little long for a Clouser. 3X is probably better, but uh, I'll show you the 4X because it's what I had ha ha handy. Um, these ones have a fairly brittle barb, so I've had to not only bend it down, but grind it down with a little grinder. Now, with the, the key component of these Clouser minnows is the dumbbell eyes. And the thing that you remember is when you're tying dumbbell eyes on the top of the hook, when you cast them, they'll flip over. So we're going to tie this inverted. We're going to put the white on the top and the green on the bottom so that when it's fished, the green's going to be on top. Now for clousers, you want to start your thread for this 4X long hook, maybe about a third of the way back. For, for, for a 3X long hook, maybe almost halfway. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to make two or three wraps to attach the thread at that point. I'm going to trim off the tag. And then I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, a big bump with the thread right there. And the reason for that is this, this is what keeps the eyes from spinning around on the hook. I'm going to come in and I'm going to put the eyes behind the bump wrap diagonally across so that it pulls the eyes up against the bump. And then I'm gonna cross them over and do it the other way. So now I'm gonna make several wraps diagonally across one way and then the other way. And I'm gonna do that a few times. Now, if you, once you've done this, these eyes will not rotate around the hook. Now I've seen Lots of guys that will tie them on the bare shank of the hook or with a little bit of thread underneath. And then supposedly to keep them from, from spinning, they go around underneath like that and around underneath like that and think that that's going to cinch it down to the hook. Well, that doesn't work. <laughs> the trick is this bump because when you tie all this stuff and push it up the, against the bump, the bump gets into where that, that hourglass shape is and it keeps the eyes from spinning around the hook. They will if you really reef on them, but uh, pretty much they stay where they belong. So now once you got them on, you dress the front of the hook right up to the eye. Stop behind the eye. And then you come back to the halfway point between where the dumbbell eyes are and the eye of the hook. I'm gonna get my bucktail. I'm gonna tie this first one reasonably sparse. I'm not gonna put a lot of hair on it. I'm gonna pick a bit of white bucktail, trim it off the hide. And again, an essential thing here is to get the fuzz out. So I'm just gonna do this to get all the fuzzy bits out. 
And I'm going to measure off against the hook as to roughly how far I long I want it. In this case, I'm going to keep it not too long. I'm going to measure the length of the shank of the hook and then put that point back at the bend. And then I'm going to grab this stuff just behind the eye. And because my hair stacker is short, I'm going to trim off the butts a bit. This isn't the final trim, but this is just so that this stuff will fit in my hair stacker properly. To get them in, I'm going to hold them down near the tips a bit. Stick them in. Then I'm going to make a lot of noise whacking it on my knee here. Stack the hair. So the tips are relatively even. I'm going to do that length measurement again. And I'm going to hold it so that I have a little bit sticking out. And I'm going to trim it maybe a little less than a quarter of an inch long square. And I'm going to hold this clump of bucktail down at a 45 degree angle with the tips right behind the eye. And then I can pick up the thread, we'll take the whole bunch over top. And I will cinch that down, Up, cinch that down. Not too hard to start with. And then I'll wrap forward on the butts to right behind the eye. Time down, good and solid. Then I'm going to wrap back to just where I tied it in. And then instead of wrapping hard back to the eye, I'm going to take my thread underneath the eyes, right behind them. And I'm going to go over top of them behind the eye, the, the, the uh, dumbbell eyes. I'm not going to pull that first wrap down very hard. Just, just snug it down to the hook shank. And the next couple of wraps are not going to be too strong either. And then I'm going to hold these, the bucktail up and I'm going to cinch it down really good onto the shank. So all of the, the hair is on top of the shank. And I'm going to take it right back to where the barb was on the hook. And because these are good solid wraps, when I let go, this hair is going to flare like that. Then I'm going to wrap forward again to just behind the eye. Again, bring the thread underneath the eyes back to where I tied in halfway down in front and do a couple of wraps. I'm gonna flip it over. Then I have some of this flashaboo. This one's a little blue color. And I cut about four strands of that out of the package. And I'm gonna lay them down right on the near side and wrap them up on top. And then I'm gonna, once I got them attached, I'm gonna pull that back and wrap over top of it so that all that flashaboo is now sitting on the underside of the hook, which is now on top because the vise is turned upside down. I'm going to measure it back to the length of the hair and cut it off. So now I've got five or six strands that lay on top of the eyes towards the back of the hook. I'm going to bring that thread back to halfway between the eyes and the dumbbell eyes and the eye of the hook. And I'm going to get my chartreuse deer hair or bucktail. Sorry. And I'm going to Take a bit of a chunk of that, and I'm going to repeat the process of cutting it, cutting it off the hide. Now this stuff is really uneven in, in length, so I'm going to take these, I'm going to pinch it good and solid at the bottom here. I'm going to take some of these really long ones, and I'm going to 
gently pull them out and I'm gonna line the tips up. And I got a couple more strands that are a little on the long side. I'm gonna line the tips up. Once again, I'll check the length and I'm gonna cut it. These all these extra bits out here so that I can get them in my stacker without them sticking way up in the air. Get the fuzz out. Into the stacker. Helps to have a really big wide stacker for this. Ah, get out there. That didn't work so good. A little bit of static here in the house today. There we go. Bucktail's a lot harder to stack than deer here. <laughs> I'm gonna measure them again. Take the extra long one out. Measure them again for length. And then I'm gonna cut them that almost quarter inch shorter where I'm pinching them. And do the same process this time. Hold it at that 45 degree angle so that it's far enough forward that the butts are right near behind the eye and my thread is gonna catch the whole group. Pull it down and then wrap those butts down towards the eye. Now by doing this, you'll see I've got a, a tapered nose on this thing now. That's, it's that 45 degree angle and picking the, uh, picking the proper length to cut it off from your fingers before your fingers so that it gets that tapered shape. And you'll notice I'm not wrapping back very far here. I'm not gonna crunch that down up against the dumbbell eyes. Get a nice tapered shape and then we'll whip finish. And we'll do a, a second one. Cut it off. And then for good measure, I'm just going to take some uh, Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails. And I'm going to just give it a very light coat on that nose. And that's pretty much done. Just pull these down so they straddle the hook. Same thing with the flash, just pull it down so it straddles the hook. And now when you fish it, it's gonna fish like that. And that's your standard Clouser minnow. Dave, how important is it um the thickness and the quantity of hair, how sparse should it be? Well, it, it varies. Um, this, this one I would say is, is medium, uh, medium thick. Th this, this one is, is a lot chunkier and it's a little, little longer. I think with the longer ones, you can probably do them a little chunkier. The other problem with tying too much deer hair is this nose gets really chunky. Um, yeah, you, I, you could even tie it skinnier than this. You could you could cut that green down quite a bit, actually, because uh, this this will represent a bait fish as well as some of the small needle fish that, that the the coho chase. Uh, they're they're fairly skinny, so you could tie them with quite a bit less uh, bucktail. 
Like I could probably get away with cutting half of that off and still be a, have a successful fly. Okay. So that's that's Clauser minnow. The next one I'm going to show you is is the uh, uh, uses a different process. Um, uh, this is was an experiment for me. <laughs> Because I'd seen these uh, these fish skulls, and I wondered what the hell are you tie with a fish skull. So that's, but I looked them up. You can get these ones. They're called. They're made by fish skull. They're called bait fish heads. And I'll get one out here. And the purpose of these things is to add a little bit of weight to the front of the fly for doing bucktail streamers. And I don't know how much you can see of these. Let me just see if I can get that on my tweezers. So let's get that up. You can see that it's, uh, let's get the magnifier here. You can see they have a little recess in it for putting the eye in. And you also notice that it's, it's not a symmetric shape. It's got one side that's got more mass than the other. And the one side with more mass is the one that goes on the bottom of the hook so that it floats hook down. So it comes like that. It also comes with little stick on eyes. And those can be a real pain in the butt when you're trying to put them on the hook. But I'll show you what I do with that. Um, the hook, that I'm going to use for these is actually a fairly short hook. It's uh, this one is a size uh, six. Um, you know, like they, these guys with their their boxes are hard to get into. They're called sticks, fire hole sticks. Get out of there! Why are you not coming? Oh, there we go. And it's, it's a, these are interesting hooks. They're about a, a one X long hook. And you'll see they have a turned up point and they're barbless. So I, I think they will be a good practical hook for fishing. They won't, uh, you don't have to debarb them and that hook point up will probably keep fall, from fall hooking too much. So what you do with this thing is put the hook in the vise. And I'm going to use, oh, I should probably show you the, the finished fly first. So you know what we're looking at. So here's, the, here's one color combination. This again is to be a bucktail. And it's white on the bottom. And I put a little bit of yellow in the middle and a little bit of dark on the top. This would be like a, a perch or something that you're going to fish as a streamer. And I've got some red uh, bucktail under here as, as throat. You'll see the eyes stick in the, in the little spot there. Um, the trick with these is, is they flare, the, the, the bucktail flares out really nicely so that when you're, when it sits, it's, it's well spread. But when you strip it, it's going to skin down and then it's going to flare out again. So I think when this is fished, it's going to give a lot of pulsating motion. Uh, I'd be interested. I, I want to give these a try because I think they're going to be a fairly effective fly. Not cheap. <laughs> Each one of these little fish heads is going to cost you about a buck because they come in a package of 10. And uh, they're about 10 bucks for a package of 10. So there's, here's the chartreuse and white. This is the one I'm gonna tie for you. And I, I think that has a, a really interesting look to it. So we'll put the hook in the vise. Dave, what hook is it? It's called a bait fish head made by fish skull. You can get them at uh, Robinson's. 
So, okay, in the race. Okay, so again, we're going to start with uh, start with the basic material, which is the white bucktail. I'm going to take a small clump, not too big, off of the bucktail. You can see about that. Same process, I'm going to try and even some tips up here. Get the really long ones out of there. Nah, that didn't work. I didn't get a big enough clump. Try again. Okay, that's better. Problem with this particular bucktail is that the that particular piece of bucktail has got very uneven hair. I'm just trying to get the tips reasonably close to length before I put it in the stacker. Tap them down there and then even them up. There we go, that's nice and even. Now for this batch, I'm going to try and keep them again about shank length behind, not overly long. And I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to tie these things. I'm going to do the same sort of thing as I did with the clouser. I'm going to cut the butts off about a little less than a quarter inch from the ends. So you can see it's about that far going to leave some room at the front. I'm going to start my thread just a little bit behind the eye, not right at the eye. And I'm going to build a little spot here where I'm going to tie this stuff in. And I'm just going to lay them parallel to the hook shank on top, but I want to leave a good I width gap there. Go over the top, gently pull down. And I still want to leave that gap because that gap is going to have to leave room for the for the fish skull to go on. And I'm going to pull this hair down so it's parallel to the hook shank and I'm going to try and get the bucktail to surround the hook shank and I'm going to use not really tight wraps to get that done. I'm going to make sure I have it kind of surrounded the hook shank here. I'm just going to get it caught up under the, underneath. bodkin and get the ones that are caught here. There we go. So now I've got thread that, that bucktail is all around the hook shank. When I get to the back end here, just where the bend of the hook is, I'm going to do a couple of really good tight wraps, which will cause that hair to flare a bit. And I'm going to cinch down all of the rest of that stuff really good and solid. Couple of times up and back, just to make sure it's make a nice solid body. So the next bit that I need to do is I'm going to use some more white bucktail. And this I'm going to be a little less concerned about the stacking of it. Actually, yeah, before I do that, I'm going to put my flash in. 
So I have some more. Let me put my pistol flash. My flash of I'm going to pick some more flash of out of here. I have this little corner done where I can pull out a few strands. This time I'm going to uh, wrap the flash of around the thread and take it up and put it down on top of the hook and then tie it in there and cut it to length. So all that flash of is kind of sitting on top of the hook. For me. And I'm gonna take my bucktail, another batch of white, maybe about a little less than the last one. Pull out the really long bits. Into the stacker. Nice and even. Make sure there's nothing loose. And once again, I'm going to measure that and I'm going to cut it just again, sort of like clear my fingers. Fairly tight stub. Now, this time I'm going to put these down just in front of where those other ones are. And I'm going to use that little 45 degree angle trick to get them down. And again, I'm trying to keep these back of the front of the eye of the hook. I want to leave this little bare space up there for where the next batch of hair is going to go. And I'm going to, I didn't catch that. Better clean that up, butts up. Oh, this is being a pain in the butt today. Let's try again. Need to need to start far enough back. There we go. There we go. Now, the trick with this is one of the things that I want to do with it is that when I get to the back end of this, I want to again do it a, a good tight cinch, and that will cause that hair to flare a bit. Tie that down. I'm going to flip her over because I'm going to put a little bit, a teeny bit of red bucktail on the bottom as a throat. Don't need to stack this stuff. It's just decoration more than anything. Once I got that on, I'm going to trim it because I don't want to have too much bulk. and sides I want to trim out. And now the chartreuse bucktail. And I don't need much here. This is just going to provide a topping more than anything. It's not going to be a huge amount of green bucktail. Because this is mostly a white minnow for me uh, imitation. And these are really long. I'm 
There you go. And check the length. And I'm not going to bother stacking these. Trimming the butts off. Once again, laying them down. Get the thread back here. Loose wrap to get it on place. And they're good. All right. So this is a much more tedious process with these than with uh, than with the clouser. Now I'm gonna, at this point, I'm gonna whip finish off. I make sure this fish skull goes on. I'm going to take my pliers and I'm going to squish it vertically a bit so that it's flat vertically. And then the fish skull comes. And you can see, as I said before, that there's a part that's more massive than the other part. And that's the part I want on the bottom. Let me get to which way it goes around here. Yeah, it's that way. And then I'm going to take my super glue. Ah, well, maybe I'm not. Oh, there we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give a teeny dab of super glue right at the front of where all that hair is tied in. I'm going to take this fish skull and I'm going to slide it on as far as I can get it. Push it back so that the so that the eye of the hook protrudes through the little slot in the front of the head. And then I'm going to take a little bit of thread here and I'm going to tie on right behind the eye and make a bunch of wraps behind the eye. And that will make sure that the fish skull does not slide off the front of the hook because that those thread wraps are going to prevent it from sliding forward as well as the super glue. So that makes sure that it's attached. So that's the basic fly. Now what I want to do with this is add the eyes. And this again is where you need the super glue because the eyes don't have much stick on them. They're uh, basically just lightly attached to this plastic that's coming. I turn my vice sideways, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put something down here so that when I drop my eyes, it's gonna land on something and not on the floor. <laughs> I've learned already. You got to make sure that you don't let them fall on the floor because they're hard to find. And I'm just gonna put a teeny dab of super glue in that recess where the eyes go. my tweezers. I'm just going to use my tweezers to slide it off the plastic and onto the head there. And into the little recess. I'm going to do the same thing to the other side. And the, the, the sliding the eye off the, the plastic is the answer to not having them fall on the floor as you try to push them. Hold them with the 
And so we just put that plastic on and we slide, slide them off of there onto, just went on the floor. Have to find that one. Oh, shoot. That one came undone. So now I'm going to take that eye and try to put him on the, this is the painful part. There we go. Come on, get on there. There we go. Okay. And that, that's him. Done. Now what the, the, the little slots in the, <clears throat> in the fish skull lets this stuff spread out at the front and at the back so that it has a very vertical profile. So that's, that's my experiment with fish skulls. <laughs> There you go. Nice flies, Dave. So that was that was something to try. I think I'm going to tie a few of these up in different colors and haul them with me up to Hanina when we're doing some bucktailing. I think they'll be very useful. Are you those mainly in the salt water, Dave? I think you could use them anywhere where you would use a bucktail. I, I think you could pull them behind the boat anywhere and they would work. I think, now, oh, there's one of the, there's the eye that fell on the floor. Put that up there. You were talking about colors, Dave. What other color, like blue, blue and dark oh, green? Yeah, I'd, I'd use dark green, um, blue. I these, these ones, these ones like, uh, that look like perch are, are I think, if I was going to be fishing in Alberta, I'd for sure have some of those yellow and, and brown ones. Uh, and they might even be interesting ones to try fishing for pike with because they have that, that dis make that disturbance in the water because they, they're spread out like that. You, you flare the deer hair really hard. And at the, by doing that tight wrap at the, at the back end of it. And I, I think that's going to make a, uh, an interesting action in the water. Something to experiment with anyway. Because I don't, I don't have a pull up all the way on the bed. During the day, I just roll up at night because I get cold. Well, with the, I'll say it again. I tied your Clouser minnow two years ago on a Wednesday, yep. took it up to uh, the spit in soup and everybody else was fishing with spinning rods and flies, everything else. And I got my first coho and it was on your Clouser mineral that I had tied the Wednesday before, so two days before. They were. Yeah. I, if, if coho are around and they're feeding on herring, uh, these Clouser minnows are absolutely deadly. I've, over the years that I've been going up to Hani, uh, uh, to fish, I've probably landed, I'd say between 50 and 60 coho on a clouser minnow. They're just a very effective fly. Would they work in fresh water? I don't see any reason why not. No. Yep, I mean, use them on uh, for bass fishing, pike, yep. muskie. They were they were originally a, a fly that was that uh, Bob Clouser tied to fish primarily for bass because he lives in Oklahoma, and uh, Oklahoma has lots of bass. <laughs> but he's also he also used them for fishing for uh, saltwater fish down in the Florida Keys as well. So it's and he's tied a couple of different versions of them. Some that are less more sparse and some that are fatter uh, they're actually good on bone fish too they yes absolutely uh, in the small but size they, you have to I, yeah, yeah. you have to tie them really thin tie them thin and and on a shorter hook yeah and mm -hmm. and really lightweight eyes uh, yeah 
Yeah, they're, they're basically like the crazy Charlie is, is basically a, a Clouser minnow <laughs> tied with bead chain eyes, <laughs> lightweight. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're a great bonefish fly. Very, and I, I, we met Bob, I, I think I might have told you that story that when we last tied them. The, the Calgary guys, uh, the guy that publishes uh, uh, that one magazine, Derek Bird, out of Calgary, they used to run an annual fly fishing show in Calgary. And one year they had invited Bob to be one of their guest presenters. And when he arrived at the airport, there was nobody there to meet him. <laughs> so he was a little put out, but one of the, the Calgary uh, people that, that, that wear their white hats and red uniforms at the, uh, at the airport, the ladies to greet visitors, saw him and said, oh, what are you here for? And where, he, he complained that the guy hadn't come to get him. And she said, well, my husband's a fly fisherman. He'll get you. So she phoned her husband. He picked him up, hauled him down to the, the venue. And they stuck him in a table because the guys at the Northern Lights used to go down to, the, to there. And we would run a, uh, a table where we would, every kid that came by, we would sit him down and tie, have him tie a woolly bugger. Just as a sort of club promotion thing. And uh, so Bob ended up sitting next to us. So we ended up spending, the guys that were there ended up spending spending a bit of time with Bob and learned how to tie his fly right and uh, then we went out for dinner with him on that Saturday night and he kept us in stitches the entire night he was just absolutely the most entertaining fellow you have ever met he was just just a, a, a fabulous stories to tell a really nice gentleman Yes, John, that was whiff and spit. So now we get to have Muhammad show us something. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I was called up from the miners to fill the shoes <laughs> of uh, Florent, and I heard some rumors that uh, it was either a fly tying injury or he's on a COVID retreat quarantining somewhere in the crow's nest. So uh, I have to fill his uh, mask shoes, unfortunately, and uh, we'll see how we do today. Yeah, he's taking his annual spring so pilgrimage gonna... to the crow's nest. That's well, right. Why is not in focus? It's not in focus. Okay, let me... Maybe closer. Okay, that is as close as I can get. Let me see if... I don't know, is that... Uh, yeah, that's good. Whoa. Is that... Oh, it was good there. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's good Right there. there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So this is called the black nose dace. Um, it is a bucktail fly, and it is um, tied fairly sparsely. I'll get into that as we tie. Uh, it is tied on uh, anywhere from you could probably even go as big as a two to a ten. I'd say uh, the hook that I have today is. Uh, a size six streamer hook and that's it right there i've already pinched the bar down and i've got my uh, fancy little uh, pliers here these are mini a mini plier set that i got at uh, canadian tire and it's great because it's smooth jawed on the inside and um, it uh, crimps down barbs nicely so the materials for this, besides the, um, the bucktail, is a little bit of uh, flashaboo in black and in pearl. You could use um, 
uh, crystal flash, in even a dark brown, um, silver, uh, and any combination of those would be fine. The other materials that you need are a badger hackle. And I, I, I don't know if you guys realize that badgers have feathers. So something like this, either a very light cream with a, a black or very dark uh, center, um, even an orangey brown color would be fine. And that would be, uh, that goes along the shank. You'll see that just now. And then the bucktail, as I mentioned, um, in black, in white, and then anywhere from a light uh, sort of a ginger up to a brown color, uh, any combination of those would be, uh, would be fine. And the thread, um, I typically see these tied mainly with black or white, but you could also go cream or even a red if you want to add uh, sort of a hot spot or accent. So lots of, lots of options on that. Um, to start off, we will go, oh, my light's in my way here. So I'm very close to my iPad and I hope I won't hit it as I, uh, as I tie here. Okay, so just get the thread, thread on there and you're doing most of your tying on the front half of the hook at most you're gonna go back to the point. Uh, you don't need to go beyond that. Um, it is a very, very simple tie. So the, what, uh, so what I do is I start off with my flashable and I tie it in. Uh, I just use a couple of strands And I, I'll go up to at most three strands of each, but I and oh the length the length of this fly, um, you go about two to two and a half times the length of the hook. Um, if you start getting longer than that, then I think you're getting into the territory of uh, missing bites. You're going to get uh, uh, nips on the end, but not uh, get hooked up. So I put in my black and uh, pearl flashaboo, and then I fold it back. I use uh, a couple of long strands. I fold it back and then uh, put it on, and then I tie, uh, cut off the excess, and that's the first part of it. Then the next part are the two feathers. And one will go on either side of the body. Uh, and what I do is I strip back, um, strip back the fibers and I just cut off the fluffy stuff at the back end. And then I just trim a little bit of the fibers to uh, create a tie-in without um, sort of like the little, just so that uh, it catches the, uh, the barbules of the, of the uh, feather. So then I just tie one in on one side. And then I do the same for the other side. And you, tr you wanna try and match the feathers reasonably closely, both in terms of length and, um, and the uh, shape of the badger pattern with the core, because some of the uh, feathers end up being um, fairly uh, um, wide black core. So you wanna try and keep it on the thin side. And um, 
when you do that, it just, it, it has sort of almost like a lateral line look to it. Okay, and then I bring the other one in and I match up the tips at the back and then tie it in. Well, and that is everything other than the bucktail. So then what I do is, uh, oh, my feathers are not quite, there, that's better. Okay, and then you wanna, now the trick here is to go sparse. Um, you don't wanna tie in too much because you're gonna be tying in four clumps of uh, hair. And if you grab too much, you are gonna be having a tougher time because um, that head is gonna grow so massive. Uh, it will be difficult to actually tie a good head on this fly. So go sparse. You can always add a little bit more. And after you tie one or two of these, you'll, you'll get a, a better sense of um, the amount of, uh, of bucktail that you need. So let me grab a clump here of white. And I will. And then when, when you cut these off, one of the things to do is there's always some short fibers and some fluff a little bit at the base. So just uh, clean those off and get them um, lined up, uh, cleaned out as best as possible. And then I also um, will use a stacker, especially if the, the length of the hairs are quite uneven, which many times they are. And then I just, this thing's not cooperating very well. Because the trick is you want to try and get um, the tips lined up as opposed to um, the base. The base is, which is what uh, happens when you pull it off from the, cut it off from the, uh, uh, this is not doing a great job, okay. Nevertheless, we'll go here. So the trick here is you not actually tying in facing backwards. You are actually gonna tie this in with the tips facing forward to start. And then you will fold it over in the, at the end to get, um, your sort of bulbous head on the on the fly. So bring it in. Try and keep it a tight clump. One of the ways to um, to try and keep it as a clump is you wrap the thread around the hair first before tying it onto the hook, and that keeps it bundled up a little bit better and avoids it uh, sort of uh, twirling around the, the hook shank. And then tie it forward. And then trim off the excess. And the way I cut it, I cut it um, at an angle, which uh, when you go back over the wraps, it actually uh, tapers down nicely at that point. And then I bring the thread back up. And then now I haven't actually tried it this way, but it's one of the things I'm, I'm actually gonna test out now because um, it tends to, 
when you when you tie in the for you don't you don't fold it back yet and tie it in. You leave this clump forward. You tie all your three other bundles on, and you leave them all facing forward. And then after you've tied them all in, then you start folding them back. And oh, actually, I just realized this was supposed to be on the bottom. Okay, I made a major mistake here. White is typically on the bottom. Your brown is on the top. And then your black is on the sides. And that again is sort of uh, almost like a lateral line. Okay. This is reverse tying a fly. That's what happens when you bring amateurs into uh, fill in big shoes. Hey, we're all amateurs here. I don't, you can't make a living tying flies, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not an easy thing to do for sure. Okay, so let's go to the underside this time. And again, I'll do my loop over the, uh, the bundle first, bring it in underneath. Okay, there we go. And you have to, uh, as you tie it in, you probably have to work this bundle to keep it together underneath so that uh, it's easier to deal with. Okay, so now this is what I was gonna do. Bring the thread forward and make a loop underneath the, um, the bundle. And hopefully that's gonna help to uh, keep it lined up and together in a bundle because once you actually tie in the other bundles it's amazing how they start sort of trying to blend together very easily so in order to avoid that this is what i'm trying out today is uh is a little bit of uh, a different uh, technique now unfortunately the bucktail i have does not have a lot of long brown fibers. Um, and this is where I will try and find a reasonable clump. Um, okay, I have another bundle here. Let's see if this one is any better. Yeah, I'd use this one before, but they're just a little too short. So here's a, uh, I don't know whether you can see that. So I got this years ago in Toronto when I was living there and I first started tying four bucks for this bucktail and this piece together. So goes to show how long I've been at it, but uh, had a long, uh, long break in between. No, this one. Okay. Okay, this is a reasonable length. It's still not as long as I'd like it. Ideally, you want um, the bundles to be about the same length um, as the others that you use to tie the fly, uh, the, fly the streamer. So 
unfortunately, I do not have a bundle that is really long. Okay, so here we go. So this time it's the brown and this bundle goes on top. And you can, you can see that this clump is not very long at all, but it will do. So again, I'm gonna take my first wrap just around the hair, and then I will tie it on top. And again, you do some loose wraps to get the positioning right. And then, uh, um, and then you can tighten down on it just the same way Dave was saying with the earlier flies. And then I'm gonna come back forward and I'm gonna pull all the brown hairs up. And there's a white one that's trying to get into that pile. And now I will take the thread around this bundle and try and keep it somewhat separated. There we go. And you constantly have to play with these because as you tighten, it likes to rotate. So, we go. And one other trick is you can always uh, use some spit and try and uh, tame the fibers a little bit by uh, using some of your saliva to uh, keep them bunched up a little bit. Now we go to the black. And again, you want to try and get a couple of long bundles. And again, just tease out some of the small fibers at the end, at the base, before tying in. Now, I don't have a rotary vise. Uh, oh, I do have one, but I haven't actually uh, set it up and use it, used it yet. So uh, I'm stuck with this vise, but I'll tie in on the camera side first, and then I'll come in and do a tie on my side. Okay. And for the poor man's rotary vise, you take the hook out and you turn it over. And that gives you a better perspective. So I'll just trim off some of the excess hairs. And you don't have to be too finicky here because once you pull the uh, butt tail back and tie it facing back, you're not gonna see these butts anyways. So. Okay. And another bundle of black. So as you can see now, uh, about tying it sparsely, uh, it's really important because it makes it very difficult when you put too much on and uh, try and um, try and tie it in. It just makes it a little unwieldy on the head.
Okay, so we've got another bundle. And this bundle seems to be slightly longer, so we'll shorten up on it slightly. So again, a first wrap around the bundle, pull it up tight to the to the hook, and then do a wrap, a light wrap, a second light wrap, and then you can start tying back and tighten it up. And then this time around, I'm going to take the black fibers and I am going to trim them off. And then come forward with it. And this is where the fibers are starting to blend together a little bit. So again, now I'm trying to get all my black fibers from this side together. And I will put a loop around, oh, actually, let me see here. I've actually got some of the black from the other side. And this is where it can get quite finicky trying to keep things separated. Okay, so I'll do a couple of wraps around. And then I'm gonna Okay. Now, this is the part where you start folding back on the hairs and forming the head. And this is where the botkin comes in really handy to try and uh, keep your clumps separate. And I have a little bit of black in here. Okay. Now, before I actually, I'm gonna move my thread a little bit more forward so that um, we're gonna be fairly close to the eye of the hook when we fold it back. Black fibers keep getting in there. Okay. So what you wanna do before you tie in, uh, fold it back is make sure your thread is back where you're gonna form your head. So you pull it, bring your thread back and then do again, uh, a light wrap and tighten it slightly. Then bring your white clump of hair and bring that around. And do a couple of light wraps. And then what you can do is if you haven't gotten it quite tight, you can always pull back on the hairs and that helps to tighten up the head. That's not in very good focus, I think. Okay. So now we have to go in between the two clumps and Okay, so one black clump is down the side. And I have one brown hair in here that is standing out. 
and I'm just going to yank that one off. I've got a couple of other strays. I'm just going to trim them right off at this point. So now you grab your last clump. And again, as you bring these back, try and keep them in a tight bundle so that it separates the colors. And there you go. So your tying thread forms a little collar. And this is where I mentioned you could use a red thread or a cream or white. And that actually, um, that actually um, helps to uh, create a little accent point. So now this is a tool that I finally got the hang of just this week. And that's the whoop finisher. Otherwise, I used to do it with my fingers the way I see Dave and a couple of other people doing it. And you do your whip finish with four or five turns. Get that tied in. Now I'm just going to take a couple of these trays and trim them off. Okay, so I'm just going to do a couple more wraps in here and one more whip finish. And there we go. So one other thing to do with this fly, uh, and the one that I had showed at the start before uh, that I tied previously, I still, uh, I still have to go get some eyes. I want to uh, put uh, stick on eyes on either side. And if you're going to do that, make sure you, um, you glue them on with uh, head cement or epoxy or UV resin because they will come off far too easily. And even with this, uh, what I do is once I've tied it, I will put a couple of coats of uh, head cement right onto the head of the uh, bucktail uh, to help strengthen the, uh, the bucktail. And this will actually absorb in a fair amount of uh, head cement into those fibers and, and make that head strong. And that gentleman is the black nose dace. Nice, thank you, Mohammed. You're welcome. I hope I didn't put you guys to sleep. Oh, very nice. Oh, well done, Mohammed. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, well, so it's a it's a good it's a good pattern for uh, as a general streamer um, in a lot of uh, rivers and that sort. Of you could even troll this. Um, with a, with a sinking line to get it down, depending on how deep you, you need to fish. Uh, but it's definitely uh, a nice pattern that uh, works well. Thank you, good ideas. Good stuff. Okay. And so, then uh, what I was gonna do is, oh, sorry, any questions? Okay. Nope. Okay, I was just going to quickly show a couple of flies that uh, one that I had mentioned previously on here. This is a fly that I have tied using foam. Uh, we had tied this in um, Ottawa at the club there. And it is a very, very simple fly to tie. Um, it is essentially one piece of foam. And for the tail, you can use a variety of different um, uh, options. You can do, in this case, I've done bucktail in sort of an, a reddish orange and a white. Um, this one is also a bucktail. Um, I've put in a little bit of uh, 
sort of uh, neon yellow uh, fuzz as almost like an indicator on the top, this, this will float high in the water. So, um, I mean, the, the, the indicator on here is not as critical on a black fly like this one. I've used a piece of yellow foam, a small strip of it underneath the, the wing. And so it actually is um, more easily visible. And then this one, I've also used bucktail, but I've also used some, uh, some flashaboo here. Um, I got them in white. And it's a, it's a very, very simple pattern to tie. Um, so that's something, uh, if any of you are interested in at any point, this is what I think I was talking about on last week's, and this one has fuzz on it, which I didn't notice. Um, this is a little minnow pattern, and it's using the mylar uh, piping that you actually remove the core of it, and you actually tie it in the front first, and then you fold the mylar back, and um, you, uh, you put some stuff underneath to, to create some body to the, to the fly. And then you also tie in your tail. And in this case, it's a little bit of uh, feather. I think it's uh, uh, olive feather and then some uh, flash blue tinsel as well. So, and then again, uh, stick on eyes. So, Hamid, that so fly. it's this one is again, yes. The foam fly is obviously a dry fly. What would you fish with it in Ottawa? Uh, this is great for bass. Bass. And <laughs> as, yeah, bass. It's and as great, I found out too. from Dave, yeah, it would be a great pike fly in the bigger, bigger sizes. And from what Dave was telling me, he's actually uh, caught a coho on it, I think. Is that what you said, yeah. Dave? Yeah, yeah. I use not on that particular, but a version called Gart's Gurglers. I've got. Oh, yeah, the gurgle version. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name of this thing. I, I, I actually made patterns for the foam that need to be cut out. And I had done that. And I can't seem to find that file that shows sort of the triangle pattern, which forms the, the, the tail, uh, not the tail, the, uh, the wings of the, of the fly. And then it's a long straight part, which I had shown last week. And I have put those away somewhere and I don't know where they are. Um, but it's one piece of foam that you tie in, uh, starting with the narrow end, you bring it back, tie it in again, near where the tail is, you fold it over, and you tie it on in a couple of spots, uh, including up at the head, and then you fold it over again, and you do your final tie to form the head uh, with the collar, and then you can, you can always use scissors to uh, shape the wings a little bit more if you want to get fancy. And um, it, yeah, it's, it's a great fly. It works uh, excellent on the surface. It'll stay high and dry forever. Um, and it's a really easy tie. I, I, this is a large stinger hook, which is great for bass because it keeps a very wide uh, a gap um, and allows uh, the hookup to go better. Um, on smaller flies, I have done it on, well, oh, actually this is another uh, stinger version uh, that you see right here. That again is a stinger hook. Um, and then the smaller flies I've just tied on a bigger, uh, I think this is probably a size four, maybe a two um hook but it's just a regular uh a regular wet fly hook but you could you could even do it on a streamer hook so those are a couple of other flies if anyone well, is interested well, you can always uh, get in touch touch with me yeah what i'll do is i'll, I'll talk to yeah, sorry go ahead. I'll, I'll talk to Flor and see if he has anything in mind for next week. And if not, maybe we'll get you to tie one of those. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah. <coughs> I had Happy a request from, from Lev. 
to tie a, 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 a leech pattern. So I was looking at this one, which is uh, Phil Rowley's mohair blood bleach. <coughs> Except I know that we were talking about at one point about the mohair that uh, comes on a spool that Robinson sells. I've got some green and some black that I can try with, but the, the pattern that Phil does, it, it has burgundy and I didn't find any burgundy mohair at Robinson's. They don't have any of that stuff on the spool anymore. I didn't find any anyway. Um, but what I did think is that it's a long fiber fly. So maybe instead of mohair, I might use Angora goat. I've got some purple and some black. I might try that and try it. the rest of the fly uses pheasant rump uh, to make sort of a shroud on it. And yeah, you uh, can't see. Oh, uh, that's probably because he's still on spotlight. <laughs> Maybe we can. There we, uh, oh, there we go. Yep, that's good. better. So, so the, the mohair stuff is this stuff that comes on a spool that I was talking about. It, it, uh, it comes spun. And I think that might work, but I don't couldn't find the color that that uh, Phil had suggested. So I thought instead I could just do a dub body because this mohair is very long. Uh, this Angora goat has very long fibers, kind of like mohair. Should be able to brush it out, similar to what the mohair does. And then it uses a, a collar of pheasant rump, and then some topping with. Uh, peacock sword, and then a, just a head of peacock curl. So I may give that a try next week and see, I'll do an experiment this week and see what it looks like. Cause I think Lev is interested in getting a little more complicated leech patterns to, to try. So I might give one of those a try next week. Yeah, I don't know whether you've seen um, any of the bunny leeches. Yeah, um, we... This is, this is one I had uh, tied actually in a full rally workshop when he had come to Ottawa. Yeah. And it's just two different bunny, bunny uh, stri um, uh, strips that are, the bottom one is, is put through the hook uh, at the back and then they, it's glued together with mm -hmm. just fabric glue. And uh, it's got a little bit of tinsel flash in there and uh, it's, uh, it's again, a very easy tie. It's literally just the bunny strips and a little bit of flash at the, that's tied into the head. You can also add a stinger hook at the back by uh, uh, using um, a little bit of mono or wire to add a second hook. Certainly another one to keep in mind. So I'll see what uh, Florin has in mind, if he has anything in mind, and if not, uh... I'll get back here and we'll pick one of those things to try it. Have a go next week. Sounds good. Sounds okay. good. Oh, by the way, any of you who, who actually do, um, uh, I, I don't know whether there's a lot of um, sunfish uh, here on the island, but yeah. the same uh, fly in foam in a mini pattern. This is, I think, about a size 10. Um, I had actually used these in, uh, in the Ottawa area and was catching rock bass and sunfish like crazy. So they're, uh, and it's fun to see the fish take it on the surface. Doesn't, doesn't stay warm enough here for sunfish. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's too cold over winter. <laughs> I caught a small sunfish on, uh, I think it was Ida and Lake, a little, little tiny pond. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh. Maybe it was somewhere else. Maybe it was um, Prospect. Yeah. Anyway, but they're only tiny, right? They're small fish. Yeah. Yeah. Not good for cooking. Something to get the two weight out for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You need to go very light on the rod for that. The two or three weights uh, actually uh, are fun catching um, sunfish on those. I don't have a two. I have a, the latest one I have is a four. 
Yeah, I've got a three which I had used for uh, trout fishing on one of the small streams um, flowing to Georgian Bay. And I was catching yeah. fish from as tiny as about four inches up to about uh, 10 inches uh, trout on there. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. You feel like uh, you've got a miniature tarpon on there in some cases. Yeah, I've got a short little seven foot six four weight old Orvis style that I used for grayling. Small streams where a long rod gets in the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good. Thank you, guys. Well, oh, thanks, guys. Sounds good. You're welcome. Well, we're yeah. Going to sign we'll off. Thank you. During the week. See you. Thank you very much. Good Easter weekend. Have a good Easter weekend and yeah. stay healthy. Easter, everybody. Stay safe. See you Tuesday. Easter. Take care. Yeah. Okay.